as we talked about in last week's message, as we roll into a new year, it's always a good time to reflect on the past 12 months from the vantage point of where we currently stand and then determine where we'd li- what we'd like to see happen or where we'd like to be by this time next year. And that holds true for an individual as well as a church. And I, for one, see that as a positive thing in that provided that we stay within some guardrails as offered to us by James, the brother of Jesus, as identified in Scripture, it's good to make plans and resolutions for the next year. I want to quickly look at some Scripture we looked at last week where in James 4, verses 13 through 15, the brother of Jesus says, Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, We will live and do this or that. So I I think that scripture offers us some solid advice uh, as we go into the new year. John 1.12 says, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, if we ponder that verse for a moment, it says that once we receive Christ by faith, we become God's own children. And as any father would, God desires to lead us in his way. Now, if you've spent some time reading scripture, I think you'll agree that God does not try to hide his will from us. He wants to reveal it. However, sometimes, you know, we don't understand God's will when we'd like to. Uh, You know, there's things that that it takes a while to sort out, and there's things that, that are hard, you know, hard to explain. But the fact is, is he's already given us many directions concerning his will and his word. For example, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us to be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And then in 1 Peter 2.15, Peter tells us that it is God's will that you live honorable lives that your honorable life should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. And then 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, God's will is for you to be holy. And we all know that holy means set aside for his purposes. So it's important to know and trust God's will, and we can discover his will through his word. We must also understand that God's will is, is it's knowable and it's provable. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So we don't, we don't normally as humans, you know, we, we don't know God's will, Uh, before we're transformed. And once we're transformed in some way into the manner of which God thinks, we can begin to see his will. Amen? And this passage gives us what I believe is an important sequence. The child of God refuses to be conformed to the world and instead allows himself to be transformed by the Spirit. And then, as our minds are renewed according to the things of God, we can know God's perfect will. But sometimes knowing God's will will seem to be difficult because it requires what? A lot of patience, right? It's natural for us to to want to know God's will and his complete will all at once, but that's not how God usually works. Instead, he, he usually reveals his will to us one step at a time with each step building strength and building a stronger trust in his promises, and that's what allows us to continue to grow in faith. And I think the same holds true in the life of a church. With that understanding, while only God knows how things will turn out, I think it's good to make changes and reorder some of the things, both in our lives and the life of our church, as we run the race of our earthly lives, always seeking God's will. 
At its most basic, the will of God is for us to repent of our sins and trust in Christ for redemption. I'm going to say that again. At its most basic, the will of God is for us to repent of our sins and trust in Christ for redemption. And those, or if we or those have not taken that first step, we have not yet accepted God's will. As for the rest of us, if, if we're closely walking with the Lord and truly desire his will for our lives, God will place his desires in our hearts. The key in wanting God's will and not our own. Psalms 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I, I did some study on that. That sounds like at first read that that verse don't, that don't match what we're talking about. But if you look at the language uh, and, and study this verse, read that again. He will give you the desires of your heart. So God places his desires in your heart. I think that's what that scripture means. With all that said, I want to let you guys know that I'm currently in the process of evaluating the finances here at the church now that we have a good solid 12 months to look at, the leadership structure, people resources, and our ministries for the purpose of fine-tuning this coming year's post-pandemic version of Ellen Woodhouse Community Church, getting us ready to move into the future. So during the next few weeks, I, I, I'm going to be asking some others to come into the loop and look at some of the things I've been looking at and some places where some changes might be made in order to help ensure the sustainability of this church. And I'm pleased to tell you that overall we are alive, we're stable, and I'm looking forward to seeing what God will do through our church in the coming year. Over the last six weeks, as I began to pray about where I might uh, go sermon-wise here at the first of the year, I was looking, you guys know I like to do this, I was looking to settle into a series based on another New Testament letter for a few weeks. And my original plan was to start the year off today by beginning some messages based on the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia, and then perhaps moving on into Ephesians sometime during the spring. So to prepare for that, I enrolled in an online course on the book of Galatians at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I plan to be ready to go this morning. However, with the events surrounding the, the recent passing of my son Jake, my plans were somewhat altered, and I decided that it'd be best to hold off beginning the new series for at least another week while I finish another session of the course that I'm currently studying. And uh, I will announce here that I completed that course Friday night. Therefore, you know, this morning, I want to spend our time together centering on some scriptures, uh, some scripture found in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 that I think directly connects to last week uh, in our New Year's message. And then perhaps we'll open up Paul's letter to the Galatians next week. How, how does this scripture, I'm going to give you a preview, how does it connect to, to last week's message? Last week's message, you may recall that we spent some time establishing some New Year's spiritual resolutions. And we did so by using the Apostle Peter's closing words in his second New Testament letter as a foundation for identifying some spiritual goals for believers in Jesus. And Bree, I don't have a bar here, but you can change this slide. But if you recall, that scripture says you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So overall, that makes a good plan for the coming year. With this verse in mind, let it be said that if we are true to our united holy purposes, then we all share some common goals, and this is one of them. These goals help answer some of the important questions that we face in our lives, such as, how will we become more like Jesus? How will we kick the habits in our lives that contaminate our relationship with God and each other? And how will we become better witnesses for Christ? So we're talking about goals. What, what are those goals? In selecting some goals for the new year, we identified last week four key ingredients 
for the growth and grace and knowledge of our Lord, as mentioned by the Apostle Peter. And you may recall that those four scripturally based ingredients say that we grow in the knowledge of our Lord by continually seeking Him. Growing in spiritual knowledge requires complete dependence on the Holy Spirit to eliminate our minds to the truth. And growing in the knowledge of our Lord requires faithfulness and obedience to Him. And growing in the knowledge of our Lord requires patience, endurance, and a teachable spirit. Finally, with those essential ingredients established, we establish five resolutions or action steps that we can take this year to help ensure that we grow in grace and knowledge. And that list of spiritual resolutions includes spend time in the Word, spend time in worship, spend time in prayer, learn from other believers, and depend on the Holy Spirit. So if you missed last week's message, I encourage you to go back and watch the recording on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And, it, and if you do that, you'll find in that message a wealth of supporting scripture for these resolutions. And if you need help accessing that, I know that's not everybody's thing. Uh, if you'll let me know, I'll send you a direct link by text or email that you can just click on to take you to those messages. So this morning... I want to expand on last week's message by showing you what the results of a life growing in grace and knowledge should look like. If I, if I tell you what the Bible says we ought to do and don't give you some steps of how to do it, uh, you know, that message is not complete. So without further delay, let's begin this morning by reading a section of Scripture from Ephesians chapter 4 and part of 5 that I believe gets to the peanut inside our spiritual M&M. In the NIV, the section of Scripture I'm talking about is subtitled Instructions for Christian Living. And in the NLT, the Scripture I'm talking about falls under the subheading Living as Children of Light. So we're going to read that. It looks like there's maybe nine verses, and we're just going to read through those. Beginning in verse 21, Paul writes, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We're moving into chapter 5 now. He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of the world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Bottom line, 
By the way, I said the bottom line part of the scripture. Don't participate in the things these people do. Ouch! Ouch! In my Tuesday night life group, we've looked at this scripture more than once over the last three and a half years. And if you've ever participated in one of the other Bible studies I've done over the years, or you know, even spent time reading your Bible on your own, you may also be very familiar with this passage. And in my mind, that's a very good thing. Because what we are looking here, looking at here in the scripture, is a tall order for our lives. That's full of great challenges. Since the, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Satan launched a major offensive against the people of God. And as we sheltered in place at our homes for weeks on end, Satan relentlessly broke down doors and infiltrated Christian homes, leaving many engaged in fierce spiritual combat with some things that they once thought were dead. And ever since then, as a people of love, it seems like we can't turn on the TV anymore without seeing a raging battle between love and progress versus hate and destruction. Now, we previously talked in depth about the role that the media we consume plays in our lives and in our thinking, and, and I've tried to offer some warnings that there's a difference between news and created content, with the difference being that real news is based on fact, while created content is news that has been manipulated for a particular agenda. And you'll find that, that it's becoming the same thing in, in some churches. Churches across the nation are opting to conform to world views rather than meeting people where they are and then placing the emphasis on letting Jesus transform their lives with God's truth. And there's a difference between creating so-called spiritual content and God's truth. So perhaps more so than ever, it's essential for us to use the truth of the scripture we hear for true perspective and to help us breed some discernment in, in everything we hear. And it's of utmost importance that we remember that despite this world's mistrust and, and seem confusion, there is some very good news for us. And that good news is the good news. And we're the eyewitness reporters for the world. With that said, I can't overemphasize how important it is this week and every other week to spend time in God's Word reading the headlines of God's good news. But more than that, that's the way we become more like Jesus. Likewise, it's also how we become reliable channels for distributing the good news of Jesus Christ to others. But even perhaps of much greater importance, as you come to know God better, you will become, become more aware of the issues in your own life regarding your own sin, which while it no longer carries the penalty of death for us, that's a done deal, we are saved, but it contaminates your lives and your relationship with God and other people you love, as well as your effectiveness to show the world what the love of God looks like. In books and stories, I've read maybe even a Jimmy Buffett song now that I think about it. Sailors are called by the love of the sea. As for me, I love baby back ribs, and with that, I'm called by the smell of hickory smoke. <laughs> Several years ago, there was a restaurant in Stockbridge named Damon's, which in my expert opinion serve some of the best baby back ribs on planet Earth. And when Damon's went out of business, I was so devastated that I almost sought grief counseling <laughs> so that I could finally move on with my life. And in fact, it's only been in, in the last few years that I can finally talk about Damon's without having a meltdown. Whenever I went to Damon's, I always ordered a full rack of ribs, extra fries, and extra barbecue sauce. Now, y'all, at least for me, you know, ribs are messy, but I always felt comfortable in Damon's because it was dark inside. 
and, and most of the people were busy playing trivia, so I could have just enjoy my ribs without worrying about what I looked like when I was eating them. It was only after I had paid my check and gone outside that I realized the front of my shirt was covered in grease and barbecue sauce. And you couldn't see the mess I had made of myself inside the restaurant because it was dark. But when I came into that street light in the parking lot, along with everybody else, I could see the crimson stains caused by the things I had done in that darkness. And I was embarrassed by what I had done to myself in that restaurant, so I desperately wanted a fresh shirt so that I could hide my shame. I think about that commercial, I'm a gainiac, gainiac. In a similar way, in God's light, you can see the sin that you did not see in your life before. And you will want to remove it once you see that. But there's no man-made product that can remove the stain of sin. And the light that reveals the stain of man's sin comes through God's word, and our cleansing only comes through the blood of Jesus. We must remember that as we made plans for the new year, that Satan has already created a customized plan for each of us for bringing chaos, destruction, and bondage back into our lives. While you may not have a thing for greasy food and barbecue sauce, doubt, worry, fear, immorality, self-righteousness, and addiction are spiritual cousins of physical stains. Therefore, this week might be a good time to let God examine you and see if there is a stubborn stain in your life. So, in our remaining time, I just wanted to leave you this morning with a three-step strategy that you can use this year for fighting sin and prevailing over it in the next year of your daily walk. And we're going to get right into that. Number one is know it. Know it. When you become a believer... The guilt of your sin is forgiven as you're covered in the shed blood of Jesus. And the condemnation that would have come upon you is removed because Christ bore your punishment on the cross. And with that said, the power of, of, of sin in your life is broken. You're no longer a prisoner because you now live under grace. But the root of sin, an inherited flesh nature, remains in the life of a believer and that's why the holy lifestyle God calls us to live is always going to be a struggle. Therefore, the, the first priority in turning from this sin is that you know what it is when you see it. And the entrance of God's word into our lives shines the light that reveals that sin that lurks in the darkness. And once you better understand what you're up against, you'll be able to make some progress. The Bible says that the flesh and spirit exist in constant conflict. Some scripture found in Galatians 5 shows us that truth, and, and I've already told you we're going to take a deeper look at that scripture in a few weeks, but let's go ahead and read the passage I'm talking about. And in the NLT, the scripture falls under the subheading, Living by the Spirit's Power. So beginning in Galatians 5, verse 16, Paul writes, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the sins of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, self-ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. The second thing that, that we can do to help us win the battle over sin is to stalk it. Now, what do I mean by stalk it? I want you to imagine that you're living in a primitive jungle village, and in one day you begin to hear that a huge leopard has come into that village and killed one of the children. So in response, you sharpen your spear, and then you go out into the bush to hunt the leopard. And with every step you take, you're carefully looking from side to side for presence of that lion or that leopard. So you walk slowly, you take inventory of your surroundings because you know that while you're stalking the leopard, the leopard is stalking you. That's how it is with sin. As you're stalking sin, you got to know that sin is stalking you. So with the knowledge gained through the study of Scripture, aided by the power of the Holy Spirit, once you've identified an area of sin that you need to deal with, start watching for its movements. If you're stalking pride or lust or laziness or unbelief, ask yourself the question, when am I most vulnerable to these sins? In other words, in what ways or circumstances do I see myself expressing these sins in my life? Despite our new spiritual condition in Christ, we reside in a flesh with a sinful nature. Therefore, you know, we must live smart. Now, if you ask envy what it aims at or where it ends, murder and destruction are its natural conclusion. And we have to remember that every unclean thought or glance would be adultery if it could be. And every coveting desire for power or fame would give away to the oppression of someone else. And every unbelieving thought would become atheism. So you must defend yourself against these things as if they have already surrounded you. How do you fight an enemy when you're in a valley? You do so by getting to a position where you can see the enemy's movement so that you can act against it. What, what people and, and places or things trigger sin in your life? Stalking sin is how you move from knowing your sin to killing your sin. If you become aware of a particular area in your life and you don't move on it, that problem is going to grow because sin is a power. It has life and vigor in it, therefore you've got to track it down and deal with it. And with all that said, I encourage you to ask yourself what sin might be stalking you at this point in your life. Dee Dee knows, but I'm, I ask her not to tell y'all. But then we have to take the proactive steps in our life to hunt those things down that are contaminating our relationship with God and the people that we love in our life. Finally, that third and last step for prevailing over sin is that we must kill it. Starting mid-verse 12, Romans 8 says that you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Again, I believe most, if not all of us in this room, have allowed Jesus to put the deeds of our sinful nature to death on the cross. Nonetheless, sin remains a threat to us in that it serves to contaminate our fellowship with God and each other and destroy our testimonies. Therefore, we should continually strive to become more like Jesus as we serve God in an important kingdom-building role for the time being. And that means that we should seek to know our sin through his truth, stalk our sin through the application of his word, and kill our sin through his power. How do you kill sin? I, I think, you know, there's at least three ways. But first, I think you've just got to set your sight on habit, uh, habitually weakening the things in your life that you know that, that, you know, may have more control than they should. Because every time you say no to the flesh... 
Through the Spirit, you weaken its power. Second, you know, we have to stand guard because we can't expect to end our struggle with the flesh in this life. We'll have it from now on. Sin's root remains in us and will always be under attack. And third, I think we need to celebrate each success. Every time you win a spiritual battle through Christ, sin's activities and actions are weaker and perhaps even less frequent than before, and your sin is less able to interrupt your peace. And I think these three efforts are part of the sanctifying work that God calls us all to do for the rest of our lives. But you only succeed by the power of the Spirit who lives in you, and it happens over a lifetime process. So the mark of a believer is not that we win every battle, is that we're always fighting, that we're always calling on Jesus to cover those sins. And we're going to have many failures along our way, but, but I think this is the path we need to be walking on this year. And then our great and perfect God is telling us today that we can do this by the power of the Spirit who lives within us. Amen. Father, we lift you up, God, and we thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you that, that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus because he covered the, the penalty, the death penalty for these sins on the cross. That was through no action that, that we took or that we could ever take. That was a free gift of grace from God through Christ Jesus. But God, we have this human nature, this sin human nature that we inherited from Adam that runs all through mankind and God, uh, your word tells us that, you know, that that's just the way it's always going to be in, in this life. Uh, but God, we also know that, that while nothing ever separates us from you once we've trusted Jesus, these things can separate us from other people. And these things can corrupt and, and contaminate our relationship with you, uh, because they, they overtake our, our transformed minds. And, 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 you know, you took the power from Satan on the cross, and through sin, through that flesh sin, it, it, you know, if we don't fight that, we give that power back to Satan, uh, other than the power of death. Uh, but, God, we, we lift up, you know, our church body. We lift up our families. We lift up our friends. Those that might be struggling with something right now, you know, maybe it's something like we mentioned, like envy or, or jealousy. Or God, maybe it's a, a drug addiction, a destructive drug addiction. But these things, God, you have placed in then all those who believe the power of Jesus in our lives to overcome these things. And we call on you, God, to strengthen us, to keep us safe, God. And we, we love you and we praise you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all remember to connect, equip, serve, and encourage one another. And we'll see y'all next week.